Hello and welcome to this video on the historical element of beer making in the 18th and 19th centuries. These centuries were the high mark of beer brewing in Europe. It was the transition from small scale local brewing of beer in the home or local community hub to a large scale industrial good that was transported thousands to tens of thousands of kilometers away and traded either for goods or cash. Beer as a wholesale product in the 18th century really was a byproduct of Pasteur. However, his involvement occurred in the middle to late point and demonstrates a significant transition, or at least in our opinion. We believe it was only possible because of this and a range of global factors. We already mentioned the international trade and supply of beer. There were the growing empires of Europe which had to supply and support overseas colonies. There was an improvement in the retention, dissemination of information and education provided. Technology supported a larger scale operation than ever before. Finally, there was nature. Collectively, all of these played a not insignificant role, and individually, some were more important than others. Beer really started to take off again in the 19th century. This is because the primary competition, wine, had had a drastic loss in production. This followed the outbreak of a pest known as phylloxera. Phylloxera affected wine production and therefore most people turned to the next available option, this being the true and tried beer production. The grape phylloxera is a specific insect that targets the grape vine, and this is a problem. The introduction of this pest species though was only possible due to globalization and the movement of people from Europe to North America particularly Eastern North America. Here, the grape phylloxera found its way to both local cultivars, after which it eventually found its way across to Europe. Once in Europe, it spread, and this affected production across the continent. This pathogen is an insect, and we've seen instances of similar outbreaks. Insects either inadvertently or deliberately introduced and turned into an invasive pest species. At the time, it was more similar to potato blight in its impact, although at this time, potato blight was caused by a microbial pathogen, not an insect. However, it did still lead to the potato blight famine of 1845. Going from the historical and natural occurrences of the time, technology was the next big factor, notably the steam engine which had a huge contribution to the production of beer. In 1765 you have the steam engine occurring in its first place. The steam engine allowed for movement of water, notably massive pumps. This meant that a brewery could continue to operate all the time, there was no concern for seasonal supplies of water. They could get water from otherwise inaccessible locations which allowed for a brewery to be set up just about anywhere so long as water could be pumped to it. You allowed the movement of beer around a brewery where previously it would be difficult to move the contents of a vat from one location to another. You also had the ability to transport both the raw ingredients and the product of beer over long distances where at one point you would be limited to the contents of a cart and how much a horse could pull, you could now load it into a train and transport it an extremely long distance. This allowed a lot more beer to be made in the first instance, but then transported away and sold at a significant profit. This led to what we would now know as industrialization, although not quite yet at the level of the factories that might come to mind with that term, we're getting to that point. Then in 1817 you have the invention of the drum roaster. Drum roasting was a more efficient method of creating malt, malt being essential for beer production. Not only could you create malt, but you could create a lot of it and you could create it to a very dark roasted level. This allowed the development of notable types of beer such as porter and stout. 
This also yet again contributed to the distribution of beer and development of it as a widely accepted, widely distributed, and almost craft level product in the way that you could choose what you wanted. In the 19th century, we also see the development of refrigeration. Admittedly, very early, very rudimentary, and very crude refrigeration, but refrigeration nonetheless, and that's important. The ability to cool down the wort and then get it into a vat and begin fermenting it that much sooner meant your production could be streamlined that little bit more. Not just production though, the ability to cool down beer would keep it safer for longer and allow that beer to be distributed over a much larger area. This meant beer was no longer a local product, nor was it something that had a shorter shelf life. You could sell it at a large volume, and people could buy it in large volume. They could then sell it over a period of time. It meant more money could change hands more freely. The average consumer wasn't so concerned about these industrial volumes though. They were worried about small individual amounts that they themselves could consume. Today you would think of this in the form of a bottle of beer, or even a can. At the time, the can was not yet readily available for beer consumption, however the bottle was. The caveat to that was that they were often corked, exactly the same as wine bottles were until relatively recently. The development of the crown cap mitigated that issue. The crown cap was a simple metal cap that went on the top of the bottle and performed more or less the same function as a cork. It, however, was not as hard to remove, didn't require specialized tools or resources to make and put in the bottle, and in some ways was better for the consumer. With the consumers having so much more alcohol in their system, you might be surprised to find that this is the same time frame in which education, and particularly literacy, began to really take off. The first thing to note here is that knowledge in the form of books was far more readily available. You have the Theory and Practice of Brewing published in 1762. This was a further refinement of things like the Reinhitzgebot. The Reinhitzgebot was a series of laws in Germany known as the Beer Purity Laws. They specified what was allowed to be put into beer for its production, and that's it. There wasn't much more information to be had. The theory and practice of brewing was an attempt to not only establish rules, but also principles and the how-to of brewing, in the form of a straightforward book. Books were increasingly common at this time, and that's entirely down to how much difference the printing press had made. The printing press was invented in 1440 or thereabouts. It took about 200 years for it to become widespread and used en masse to produce not just books of knowledge, but things like pamphlets. These pamphlets had various foci, everything from cooking instructions to how to live poor, politics to cartoons. This was important at the time because it was coupled with greater literacy among the wider population. They could not only write, but read, and so if you had things like pamphlets and books, they could be used. The spreading literacy among the population led to an ever-growing middle class of bureaucrats, and in 1767 we not only see the juncture of bureaucrats but also entrepreneurs. At this time a British entrepreneur came to an agreement with the East India Company to supply beer. This wasn't anything unusual, nearly all sailors received a ration of alcohol. What was unusual here was that they weren't supplying it for naval purposes, rather the beer was to be shipped to India, India at this time being a many month voyage. In order for beer to be able to get to India, it had to be modified. A normally made beer would either turn to vinegar or go rancid well before it arrived. In order for this contract to be met, and the British civil servants in India to have their beer supply, they had to change it, and they did this one simple way. They doubled the concentration of hops. Doubling the concentration like this allowed it to survive the long journey over there, both with flavour intact and without any contamination or turning rancid from microbes. 
This led to the beer style we now know as the Indian Pale Ale or IPA. At the same time throughout the 19th century, people were becoming more and more knowledgeable in how to make beer, what fermentation was, and how to filter it. This made it possible for breweries to not only expand, but for more independent breweries to be set up. These small operations could start that way, but they would quickly grow. The knowledge though wasn't enough by itself, you needed more. This is where Louis Pasteur comes in. Remember we're getting towards the end of the 19th century here. He was trying to understand not just fermentation, but what role yeast had in it. What he found was that you could pasteurise beer. Pasteurisation is something you're likely to see on every bottle of milk you buy. It's intended to destroy any pathogens without affecting the taste of the milk or any of its nutritional value. Pasteurisation of beer was what Louis Pasteur first developed, 22 years before milk was pasteurised. That means beer gave rise to one of the more fundamental treatments for milk we see today. Later on, we go on to what Louis Pasteur might be more famous for, but not by Louis Pasteur, microbiology, and specifically the use of cell cultures. In 1883, Denmark began getting single-cell yeast cultures. These were effectively monocultures of yeast that were full of desirable traits, but none of the undesirable traits. It meant that they could make beer that had a consistency. It didn't have off flavours, and they could keep making the same beer time and again. That meant that Denmark contributed massively to many of the cultures that we see now if you have to go to a home brew shop. They will say, such and such lager yeast, ale yeast, champagne yeast, and it's generally going to be a single yeast culture. The mid-19th century was the golden age of brewing. At that time, there were many breweries developed and a great many of those breweries survive to today, and are the better known brands of beer. Beer wasn't just necessarily something that existed for consumption, trade, and things like that. Rather, it contributed to both governance and social unrest, particularly social unrest as a result of taxation. Let's take developments from 1789, where low tax laws were proposed. These were intended to encourage production of domestic beer. That would help to reduce America's dependency on other countries for their beer supply. 1792, you have New Hampshire deciding to not just encourage beer production, but to not tax brewing at all. In 1830, you have England introducing a law that allowed for anyone to buy a license to brew and sell beer. That had several benefits, one of the simplest of which was that it allowed them to get payments up front and thereby raise revenue, but it also allowed them to track who was selling beer and who was making beer. Therefore, they could follow up and tax them both on production and sale. Other countries had similar ideas. For example, Frederick the Great wanted to encourage beer production and consumption, not necessarily because it was great as an alternative for otherwise bad water, but instead because they were able to tax this and therefore generate revenue. Revenue was a big factor, and in 1830 that came to a head in Belgium. Belgium was at the time part of the Netherlands, but they rebelled. One of the big driving factors was that the Dutch were placing very heavy taxes on beer. As you can see, over a period of about 200 years, beer went from something that was made in monasteries and the home to a widespread internationally trafficked good. It was a driving force in not just taxable income for the state, but for the individual if they could supply it in the right ways, the right quantities and ensure that they were paid for their goods. Different technologies and developments we know from history, such as refrigeration and pasteurization, all have a relationship with beer around this time. We know more about microbiology now, thankfully in part, to beer. Beer had a huge role to play, 
and although the market for it has plateaued in the last century, the production is still there, and although we're still not getting the same sort of developments we might have over these two centuries, there are different developments in the ways beer is made, and the diversity of beer that is available. Thank you for watching this video. If you have found it interesting, consider liking, sharing, and subscribing. Please post any comments, questions, or suggestions that you have below.